Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back. Did you miss virology? Yes. Did you miss viruses? Yes. That's right. You had them with you wherever you went. Well, I missed all of you. Today I want to talk about viral virulence what it means, how we learn about it. This is an important topic to understand because if we can figure out what makes viruses virulent, we might be able to control that as a strategy for making them unable to cause disease. If the, an important concept we have to talk about initially is that most of our work in studying virus virulence is done using animal models. <clears throat> it's very difficult to use people to do these experiments. You can do a little bit of human experimentation with viruses, but it's limited and it's very expensive. So you can't do the sorts of experiments that we can do in animal models. We call these animal models. We use laboratory animals. Mice are really good ones because they are they can be inbred and be quite similar in their genetic properties. They can be gene genetically manipulated, but not every virus will replicate in, an, in a mouse. So other typically used uh, animals we use, uh, many people use monkeys of various sorts. You can't use chimps anymore. Those are outlawed for virus work. Ferrets is a popular model, guinea pigs. Um, what else? Anyway, there are a whole bunch of them. But the mouse is the most uh, commonly used one, if possible. And in general, it's a model. We call it a model because it never mimics exactly what happens in people. And you have to always remember this. The press often forgets this. Reports experiments done in an animal model, assuming the results will apply to people. And we will talk about this in great detail in the last, one of the last lectures of this course. So we call them animal models. They are not humans. There are many things you can do with mice. Uh, you can add receptors to them. I'll tell you about that in a moment to make them be infected with a virus. Sometimes we put the complete virus genome in a mouse. We can make transgenic mouse. So we can add genes to the mouse. We can disrupt genes in the mouse. We can express individual viral genes. We can also um, manipulate the immune response. We've already seen a little evidence of this in our discussions on immunity, how we can take T cells from one animal and give them to another. You can put human immune systems into mice for viruses that require a human immune system to replicate in, like HIV-1. Uh, you can delete immune parts of the immune system. You can, you can uh, overproduce cytokines, for example. Lots, lots of things that you can do. And of course, then you go on to study what the virus does in that animal model. Now, in general, we do two things in studying viruses in animals. Obviously, what we'd like to know is what, what controls, say, virulence of a human virus. So in some cases, we can take a human virus, a virus that circulates among humans only, like poliovirus, and infect an animal model with it. Now, this doesn't always work right out of the box. You don't, can't take any given virus and put it in a mouse and assume it's going to replicate and cause disease. Sometimes you have to manipulate the mouse, which I'll tell you about in a moment. Sometimes you have to adapt the virus to grow in mice. You have to passage it from one mouse to another for 10 or 20 or 30 passages until mutations are fixed in the virus genome, which allow it to replicate in mice and then you study that virus, but obviously that has issues because that same virus is not replicating in people. So the, all these problems that you have to deal with when you put a human virus uh, into an animal model, you have to remember whatever results you get, you have to somehow try and test in people, and the only way usually you can do that is by making epidemiological observations. The other approach you can take is to study animal viruses that resemble human infections. So there are plenty of viruses in mice that are natural pathogens of mice that are related to human viruses that are in the same family, for example. And sometimes if you're lucky, the disease will be the same. And sometimes by studying that, you can get 
information about what goes on in people infected with the similar virus. Obviously, these are all compromises. In the, in the best world, of course, we'd love to be able to infect each other, but we can't. It's not ethical to do that because the outcome in some cases would be death, right? So you can't do that. There, we'll talk later about some uh, virus experiments in humans that can be done, but that's out of the question. We can't do that. So we use animal models. Now, many people will say, why bother at all? Why do any experiments in animals if you can't directly extrapolate. Well, then we'd be doing no experiments whatsoever in a, in a living host, and that would uh, be a problem. A great deal about what we know about immune responses to infection comes from work on animal models. So as long as you understand that it's not a direct extrapolation to people, you'll be fine. So let me tell you an example of an animal model that we actually made uh, in our laboratory a number of years ago. And this is a mouse model for poliovirus infection. Poliovirus is a exclusively human virus. As far as we know, it infects no other animals out there in the wild. If you infect a mouse with poliovirus by any route, you can put 10 to the 9th, 10 to the 10th PFU of virus into the mouse. The mouse will run around happily and never be ill because the virus can't get into mouse cells. It can't replicate in them. So we identified in my lab a long time ago the cell receptor for poliovirus. This is a human protein that the virus binds to to initiate infection. We clone the gene encoding this receptor. Mice do not have this gene. They don't have anything that looks like it. They have something that looks similar, but it doesn't bind poliovirus. We then took the gene encoding this receptor and we made a transgenic mouse poliovirus receptor transgenic mouse, and one of them is shown here. And when you infect these animals with poliovirus, they get paralyzed. You can see this mouse has hind limb paralysis. So all it took was to put the receptor for the virus, which is a human-specific protein, uh, into the mouse as a transgene, and it becomes susceptible. Now you can study infection. So this is actually remarkable that it's only the receptor between uh, infection with polio in the mouse, but that's the way it is. But what, what can we say about human polio? These animals get paralyzed. The virus goes into the spinal cord just like it does in human polio. It replicates in neurons. It destroys them. But how extrapol uh, extrapolatable is it? Well, in humans, as we'll see uh, next time, you acquire infection by ingesting the virus. If you feed virus, virus to these transgenic mice, nothing happens. Their guts are not susceptible to infection. So there you go, right away, a big difference between human and mouse polio. So uh, just another warning that you can't extrapolate everything from a mouse model to humans. So, nevertheless, we studied this model for many years and we learned a great deal. One of the things that we learned is relating to the tropism of infection. In humans, poliovirus only infects the gut and, the, and neurons in the spinal cord and brain. And as I've mentioned before, I think that the incursion in the CNS is an accident. The gut is the normal place where the virus replicates. No other tissue is infected. Nevertheless, in humans, the receptor protein can be found in every tissue, heart, stomach, kidney, muscle, it's everywhere. But the virus only replicates in, the, in humans in the gut and the spinal cord. It's the same situation in mice. The receptor is actually present in the gut of mice, but the virus doesn't replicate there. It's present in kidney and heart and muscle and many other places, yet the virus only replicates in the spinal cord. It turns out that that tropism, we worked for many years to figure that out. This is a really interesting question in virology. That tropism is determined by the interferon response because if you now knock out the interferon type 1 system in these animals, and infect them with poliovirus, the virus replicates in every tissue, all right? So that's what's here, interferon alpha beta, the type one interferon system controls poliotropism. You can make a lesion in the gene encoding the receptor for type one interferon in these animals. You can knock it out so they don't respond to interferon. And now every tissue is infectable. This sounds great. Do I think it's the same in people? Who knows? I have no idea if interferon controls tropism in us. And we can't very well knock out 
um, the interferon receptor in people and infect them. That's out of the question. So it's probably nothing we'll ever be able uh, to sort out. Certainly there are people out there with mutations in the gene that is encoding the, either the interferon receptor or interferons. And perhaps in those individuals, the virus would replicate in unusual places. So that kind of study could be done, but nowadays there's so few polio left globally, we can't do it. So that's the kind of extrapolation you have to do from an animal model. You make a conclusion from an animal model, this gene is important for tropism, and then you do observational studies in people to try and validate it. Okay, now virulence, yes? Okay, the question is, why is the brain and spinal cord infected, even with an intact interferon system, right? I think we are working on that, and I think the brain doesn't mount a good interferon response, all right? It's lacking. Why would that be, do you think? Is it that the brain tries to protect itself from the negative effects of too much interferon? Exactly. Interferon is dangerous. It's bad. It's toxic. So the brain, I think, in the spinal cord does not want to express have a robust interferon response. I think it would damage the cells, and as you know, not a lot of renewable cells, neurons in particular, are not renewable in the CNS. So our, our data suggests that, in fact, the interferon response is muted, and that's why the virus can get uh, into our CNS. My view of the brain and spinal cord is that it views itself as pretty protected, and it is. It's got a good bar barrier, but some viruses can sneak in. Not a lot, but once they get in, then they cause a lot of damage. Okay, so have we tried putting genes in the brain? I would like to do that, but I'm told it won't work because the mice will die, all right? So we have a specific interferon-induced gene that we think is lacking in the mouse brain, and it happens to be pro-apoptotic, and I think that's why it's not expressed in the brain, but it happens to also be very important for inhibiting poliovirus replication. So I would like to make a transgenic mouse expressing that, but I'm told that the mice will die, so. Not sure we're going to do it, but it's, that's the experiment we would like to do, exactly. All right, so what is viral virulence? It is the capacity of a virus to cause disease in a host. So we talk about virulent viruses as causing disease, and avirulent viruses as not. Sometimes we call them attenuated, or we say their virulence is attenuated. Many vaccine viruses are attenuated in their virulence. They don't cause disease, but they give you an immune response. We can measure this. We have devised ways in the laboratory to measure virulence, and these are just some of them. You can infect a mouse and see how long it takes to die if the virus causes a lethal infection, or mean time to appearance of symptoms, whatever the symptom is that you're looking for. Uh, fever and weight loss. So for influenza infection of mice, weight loss is often a parameter that's measured because influenza causes a transient drop in weight of the mouse and then when they recover the weight comes back. You can also measure the lesions caused by the virus. So for polio, we know, well you could, you could say is the mouse paralyzed or not, but that's a crude measure of virulence. You can actually section the spinal cord and brain and look for, this, for the neuronal death caused by virus. You can have a pathologist look at sections and give a number to that. And that's what I mean by the lesions. And for, for HIV, the reduction in the number of blood CD4 positive lymphocytes is a, is a good measure of the virulence of the virus. These are just a few. There are many, many more uh, ways that we can measure virulence. So here are two examples with two different sets of viruses. So on the, on the upper left is infection of mice with two strains of poliovirus. And we're looking at the day after infection and the number of surviving mice. So this experiment, five mice were infected. Uh, this, the virus was put directly into the brain with a needle. And then we're simply looking at each day and asking how many mice are surviving. And you can see with the red virus, type two poliovirus, uh, eventually the, after day five, the mice begin to die until they're all dead uh, by day 10. Type one poliovirus, in contrast, does not kill the mice. So this is a very crude measure of virulence. By this assay, we would say clearly type 2 is virulent 
in mice, but type 1 is not. On the right is a, a similar exper experiment done with different flaviviruses. These are uh, five different kinds of flavies, including dengue, West Nile virus, uh, yellow fever, Japanese encephalitis. Uh, and again, this is an assay in mice. The virus is injected into mice. And then we're, we have on the left what's called a relative neurovirulence score. So after injection, the mice are sacrificed, and you make sections of the brain, and you look under a microscope for destruction of neurons. You have to be good. You have to be able to tell a dead neuron from a live one. But you count them, and you give it a numerical score, and that's what the bars mean here. And it, furthermore, we are also looking at uh, lesions within different parts of the CNS, cerebellum, brainstem, and spinal cord. So you can see that the Japanese encephalitis virus uh, is quite neurovirulent, 100% being the maximum score seen. And then the others have uh, sort of a gradient from left to right where dengue is the least neurovirulent. But even with a single virus, you see the lesions here in the spinal cord are much higher than uh, in the brainstem and the cerebellum. So again, a way of measuring neurovirulence a little more quantitatively uh, than just looking at survival. Now, virulence is a relative property. You can never, you have to understand that it's influenced by many things, including the virus, the dose, the route of inoculation, the age of the animal, the type of animal used, all sorts of things, more than I've listed here. So you can never compare the virulence of two different viruses. Well, if we go back to this previous slide, you can say here on the left that type 2 poliovirus in mice inoculated intracerebrally with a certain dose is more virulent than type 1. But you can't say that type 2 polio is more virulent than dengue virus because they're different viruses. You simply cannot compare them. You cannot make those kind of um, comparisons because it's a relative property that's influenced by so many uh, different things. So you can't compare the, diff the virulence of different viruses. You can't say that one virus of a different family is, is more virulent than another or less virulent. And if you want to compare similar viruses, the assays must be the same. So in the previous slide, we can compare the virulence of polioviruses and we can compare the virulence of flaviviruses, but we can't cross uh, the families. Here's an example of how the route of inoculation influences virulence. These are two different uh, examples here. So on the top, we have two growth curves of viruses uh, in mice. And we're looking at, uh, on the left, this is virus uh, in the blood here on the, on the left-hand graph. So these are suckling mice inoculated subcutaneously. So just the virus is put right under the skin. And then we're measuring the amount of virus in the blood. This is a PFU per milliliter. Uh, or a microliter of blood. So we have um, four different conditions here. We have a virus called Tenya, uh, which is, and we're measuring virus uh, in the brain or in the blood. Sorry, I, I forgot about the brain part here. So virus in the brain or the blood. And Tanya is these two lower lines here. You can't see the colors very well. But basically it's not replicating uh, in the blood. You don't find it in the blood and you don't find it in the brain. In contrast, La Crosse, which is a different strain of the same kind of virus, you can see uh, good, good amounts of virus in the bra brain and in the blood. And in fact, this virus is neurovirulent. When it reaches the brain, the Lacrosse virus, it causes neurological symptoms. And here you can see that the virulence depends on peripheral replication. So Tanya cannot replicate peripherally after subcutaneous injection, so it can't reach the brain. Uh, whereas La Crosse virus can. And it's not shown in this uh, experiment, but that's the conclusion. Now, if you take these viruses and put them directly into the brain, both La Crosse and Tanya, and we're looking at virus per milligram of brain, you can see they're both able to grow in the brain. So Tanya, in fact, is growing to an even higher level in the brain than La Crosse. And they're both neurovirulent when given by this route. So if you put them both in the brain, they replicate well, and they both cause disease. They're both virulent. If you put them peripherally, Tanya cannot reach the brain, so it never has a chance to be virulent. So if you didn't consider the route of inoculation in this experiment, you would just say that Tanya is not 
neurovirion. But that isn't true because you see that if you put it right in the brain, it is. So that's why route of inoculation is so important. You have to specify it when you uh, describe the results of a virulence assay. Here's another example on the bottom. Again, inoculation of mice with two variants of lacrosse virus, the same virus we talked about on the top. We have a wild type lacrosse virus that is an unmanipulated virus in suckling mice. One PFU, one virus particle is enough to kill half of the animals. All right, in suckling mice with the wild type virus, subcutaneously the same thing. But if you look at an attenuated mutant virus, uh, IC, uh, one PFU is enough to kill, but subcutaneously over 100,000 are needed to kill 50% of the animals. So you can see the virulence is apparently different by the sub-Q route, but not by the IC route. Uh, the picture changes in adult mice, which have a different immune system, a well-developed immune system. Uh, the LD50, IC of the wild type is 1, as it is in the other situations, but subcutaneously it goes up to 10. So apparently you need a little more virus in adults because they're mounting an immune response. One PFU is not enough to do it as it is in suckling mice. Uh, and the attenuated lacrosse mutant, you need quite a bit of virus to uh, kill 50% of the animals, either IC or subcutaneously. Look at the big difference, IC in adults, 10 to the 6th versus suckling mice, 1. So clearly the immune system of the adult makes a big difference here. So the age of the mouse and the route of inoculation are two things that we explored here. And this is just one of the many, many factors that influence virulence and that you have to specify. Which statement about viral virulence is wrong? So it can be influenced by dose, route of infection, species, age, gender, susceptibility, of course, all those things can influence. It can be quantitated by measurement of fever. That's one way. It's a symptom of virus infection. You could measure fever. Ebola is more virulent than human papilloma. Absolutely not. You cannot compare two different viruses. These are from different virus families, cause very different diseases. Ebola causes a hemorrhagic fever, papilloma, a tumor. So you can't compare those at all. Is the, is the capacity of a virus to cause disease? Yes. And when comparing virulence, the assays must be the same. Absolutely. Okay. So. As I said at the beginning, we study virulence to identify how it's controlled with the hope of somehow intervening. So if we can identify genes in either the virus or the host that modulate virulence, we may be able to use that for some therapeutic uh, approaches. And the way we identify virulence genes, and I say genes in quotes because they're not always coding regions, they can be non-coding regions. We make mutations in the virus and we infect an animal. So if we have a virus that causes disease in an animal, poliovirus infection of our transgenic uh, receptor mice it causes paralysis, we can then make mutations in the viral genome to identify genes that are important for causing disease. And that's illustrated uh, on this slide. So you take a wild type virus, which you can grow in cell culture, and, and then you inoculate mice in this case, if it's poliovirus, it's neurovirulent. It causes paralysis or lesions in the, in the CNS. Now you can make mutations throughout the virus genome and individually measure their virulence. Now here is an example of a virus with a mutation that leads to a general defect in replication. So in cell culture, it doesn't grow very well. You have small plaques. The titer is lower. You put this into animals, it's attenuated. It doesn't cause much disease, if anything, because replication is clearly needed to cause disease in an animal. I mean, that's, that I think is obvious. For most, in most cases, the virus needs to replicate in the animal to cause disease to be virulent. And high replication is probably paralleling high virulence. But then there are genes which, when mutated, don't really affect growth. Or if at all. This one has an effect on plaque size, but the titer is the same. Yet this virus, when inoculated, inoculated into the mouse, is attenuated. And this is an interesting gene to study because it is specifically required for virulence. It's not needed for growth in cell culture. The, the reduction of replication is absolutely important, no doubt. But many genes, when mutated, will cause the virus to replicate less. But this one, a mutation in a gene required for virulence that's not needed in cell culture, this is very interesting. And these genes, 
uh, that, are, that are involved in virulence. I've already told you there are, some of them are involved in replication. So if you make mutations in the RNA polymerase of a virus that messes up the polymerization ability, that virus is going to be attenuated because it doesn't grow well. But the more interesting ones are those that aren't needed in cell culture, like genes that influence invasiveness. If you put a virus subcutaneously and it doesn't get into the CNS, that's invasiveness. That's an invasive property. That would be interesting to understand how that works. Tropism, genes that are involved in tropism. I told you about a cellular gene involved in poliotropism in mice, the interferon type 1 receptor. But there are viral genes as well. And then we learn by doing these kinds of experiments, that's how we found these genes, viral genes that modify host defense mechanisms, which we talked about extensively uh, in the last two lectures. There are also genes that allow viruses to spread. And then there are other viral genes that actually can kill cells in a variety of ways. And those, of course, would make the virus more virulent. So um, sometimes these virulence genes don't actually encode proteins. And then I, so that's why I call them virulence determinants. Because as you know, the definition of a gene is that it encodes a protein. Uh, and these are two examples where mutations in non-coding regions can reduce virulence. And the first example is poliovirus. The vaccine strains of poliovirus that are used to eradicate polio globally today, these infectious uh, Sabin vaccines, they have mutations in the five prime non-coding region uh, that make them attenuated. I'll show you an example of that in a moment. And then another virus of mice, mengovirus, also changes within the five prime non-coding region and what's called a poly C tract affects virulence. The wild type strains have long poly C tracts in the five prime N. As you make them shorter and shorter, which you can do by mutagenesis, the viruses get more and more attenuated. We don't know the mechanism, but it's a non-coding mutation. So here's the poliovirus genome on the lower left. It is a plus stranded RNA of about 7,400 nucleotides. It has a protein at the 5 prime N. And it has quite a long 5 prime non-coding region, which I have expanded above as this green line here. And you see it has lots of RNA secondary structure. This, of course, is the iris, the internal ribosomal entry site of this virus that allows ribosomes to bind internally. Now, Albert Sabin in the 1940s and 50s developed three types of polio vaccine. So polioviruses occur as three serotypes, one, two, and three. And the vaccine that we get has all three serotypes in them. He developed three serotypes of an infectious attenuated vaccine strain, which is infectious. You take it orally and it replicates in your gut. And all three strains that he developed, he did this empirically. And we will talk about this in the vaccine lecture. He had no molecular biology, he had no sequencing, he had no genetics to, to speak of. But his three viruses, which do not cause paralysis in most people, have mutations in uh, this 5' prime non-coding region, in particular in this stem loop number 5 right there, which is expanded to the right. The type 1, the type 2, and the type 3 vaccine strains all have single base changes here within a very short region. One of these is enough to completely abolish the neurovirulence of these viruses. And it's in a non-coding region. And we actually worked on this many years ago. And here's one of the experiments we did. This is infection of transgenic receptor mice with polioviruses. And two viruses are used in this experiment. And they differ only by one base at, four, at base 472 in the 5 prime non-coding region. Let me go back and show you where that is. Here, 472. Uh, the wild type virus has a C. The vaccine strain of Albert Sabin's has a U. Now, if you take viruses with a C or a U, and you inject mice intracerebrally. On the top, here's the virus with a U. It does not paralyze the mouse. It doesn't kill any mouse. So here, the LD50, the 50% lethal dose is greater than 2 times 10 to the 7th. We can't put enough virus in the brain of these mice to kill half of them. In contrast, a virus that differs only at one base, 472 with a C, the LD50 is 9,000 PFU. So one base change is enough to change the virulence 
of this virus. And that is one of the reasons why these vaccine strains are safe and they don't paralyze you, yet they give you uh, immunity. Now the viruses with C replicate quite well in the brain of mice, so this is a virus per gram of brain over time after inoculation, whereas viruses with a U are cleared. They simply don't replicate well having that U uh, at 472. Other virulence determinants are the gene products, some of which we've talked about, that modulate the immune response. We've talked about a whole bunch of them that modulate apoptosis and autophagy, virokines and viroceptors, the mimics of cytokines and cytokine receptors, complement binding proteins, the, the proteins, the virus, various virus proteins that interfere with the MHC1 and 2 pathways. We talked about this uh, a couple of weeks ago. When people started making mutations and looking for attenuated viruses, these are the genes they found. If you knock out uh, a protein, a viral protein that modifies MHC2, then the immune response has the upper hand. The virus can't overcome uh, antigen presentation. So these are virulence determinants for sure. The interface between the virus and the immune system is absolutely critical for virulence. And by taking out these genes, uh, we alter that. These genes are not needed for growth in cell culture. We don't have an immune system in cultured cells, so they don't matter for the virus. You take them out, the virus replicates very well. There's no defect in growth of the virus in cell culture. But if you put any virus with a mutation in any of these genes into an animal, the disease is, is reduced. Virulence is attenuated, as we say. So these are virulence determinants. So the, if the, the broader question, which is quite interesting, why does a virus have to be virulent? Why does it have to cause disease? Why can't it just coexist peacefully and replicate us in us and spread? The answer is because we mount an immune response to try and get rid of it, and in turn, the virus develops immune countermeasures which make it virulent, unfortunately. So if we, you know, it, it, I don't know which came first, the immune system or the virus, probably the virus, but clearly our defenses are a big contribution to the evolution of virulence. Here's an example of one of these genes. This happens to be a gene in a herpes virus. It's a, a particular herpes virus called gamma herpes virus 68, which can infect mice. It's a very nice mouse model for infection. You infect mice, you get a cellular infiltrate of various sorts in different organs and lethality eventually. So on the left is a, a percent survival curve where we have infected mice with the wild type virus, which is the blue, uh, at different doses per mouse. And you can see at about 100 uh, PFU per mouse, uh, all the mice are dead. We don't kill all of them, but pretty much all of them. And that's the survival curve. If you delete the gene encoding a protein called M3, M3 encodes a chemokine receptor. Now remember, chemokines are produced by infected and immune cells as a way of drawing the immune response to the infected area. They're really important for chemotaxis of lymphocytes and dendritic cells. This virus makes a chemokine receptor that binds these chemokines and prevents them from attracting the immune cells. So it's, it's modifying uh, the response, the immune response, by altering the invasion of immune cells to the infected area. So if you delete uh, this gene from the virus, it grows very well in cell culture. No problem, because it doesn't need this in cell culture. But here in mice, this is the result, delta M3, the green. You can see its virulence has changed. You now need a lot more virus to kill uh, animals. And you see with 1,000 PFU, uh, you, you're not killing as many animals as the wild type. But if you back off here to 10 PFU, you can see there's a big difference in the lethality. That's why you do a gradient of inocula, because if you just use one high inocula, you might not see much of a difference, because here you're overwhelming uh, the animals. When you now restore the gene to the virus, that's delta M3 MR, you now get lethality restored. So whenever you delete a gene from a viral genome, you need to put it back to show that your manipulation hasn't made a change somewhere else uh, in the genome. On the right is the effect uh, of these manipulations on cellular in infiltrates uh, in, in a tissue which I don't recall here, but we're looking at macrophages, neutrophils, lymphocytes, et cetera, in mice uh, infected with the three different viruses. So you can see there is some effect on 
infiltration of macrophages. The delta M3, uh, more macrophages are coming in, but less neutrophils, for example. So again, consistent with the idea that this is a chemokine that's influencing cell type infiltration. So just one example of how uh, these immune modifiers uh, are virulence genes as well. Now in the bacterial world, many bacteria make toxins that cause disease, okay? All manner of pathogenic bacteria have various toxins that uh, are, are responsible for many of the symptoms like diphtheria toxin or cholera toxin. There are very few examples in the virus world of toxins, protein toxins like that. But here is one, which is the, one of the exceptions. And this is in rotaviruses. These are viruses we'll talk about next time, which cause gastroenteritis. They infect the epithelial cells of the intestinal mucosa, and that's a small section of which is shown here. And here are the rotavirions uh, infecting cells. One of the viral proteins, called NSP4, is a viral toxin. It causes damage to the intestine. If you just make that protein and feed it to an experimental animal, it will cause gastroenteritis in the animal. All right, the protein itself is responsible for many of the symptoms of infection. And the way it works, it probably works in many ways, but one of the ways is that it causes an increase in calcium levels in cells. This disturbs uh, the water balance in the intestine. Water is secreted from the cells, and this is one of the reasons why you have diarrhea. So the protein is interfering with calcium stores uh, in the cell. This protein is produced from infected cells, so it can also bind uninfected cells. Apparently there's a receptor for the protein on the surface of cells, and those cells will also experience this fluid uh, imbalance. And finally, we think the protein interacts with the enteric nervous system. Serotonin, of course, is an important mediator of the state of the intestine and disturbances that, such as gastroenteritis, vomiting, diarrhea, can be linked to perturbations in serotonins, and those are associated with the um, protein interacting with the enteric nervous system. So again, if you delete this protein or you mutate it, you will affect the virulence of the virus uh, in an animal. Another example of a virulence factor, this is a cellular virulence factor. So far we've talked about viral genes that infect virulence, but there are many cellular genes that do as well, and this is an exploding field. TRIM5-alpha, TRIM is one of a member of a large family of proteins. Uh, and this particular one, TRIM5-alpha, is a virulence factor for HIV infection. Now, old world monkeys can't be infected with HIV. As we'll see later, uh, HIV emerged or evolved from SIV, simian immunodeficiency virus, and that's what these old world monkeys have. They can be infected by SIV, but not HIV. And the reason they're not infected is because of this protein TRIM5-alpha. When the viruses infect cells, uh, the TRIM5 protein binds to the capsid and degrades it before its DNA can be made from, by reverse transcription. All right, so this TRIM5-alpha blocks old world monkeys from being infected by HIV-1 but it does not block SIV from infecting these animals. So the natural pathogen of old world monkeys, SIV, can infect them because it's evolved to escape TRIM5-alpha restriction. Humans have a TRIM5-alpha protein, but it does not block HIV infection. And on the other hand, uh, it, it does block SIV infection. So HIV has evolved in humans to escape the restriction imposed uh, by trim 5 alpha. So it's an example of a cellular protein that influences virulence. There are also determinants of virulence in cells that are not proteins. Non-coding regions, microRNAs is one example. And one of them is really interesting. It's called MIR-122, microRNA-122, which is a liver-specific microRNA. So it is a normal human microRNA. You know, our genome contains uh, over a thousand microRNAs that are used to regulate our gene expression. And one of them is MIR-122, which actually has a role in regulating cholesterol levels. Turns out that hepatitis C virus requires MIR-122 
to replicate. And hepatitis C virus, as the name would suggest, is a liver-specific virus, and it replicates in the liver probably because that's where MIR-122 is. Now, microRNAs are 21 nucleotide long RNAs produced by cells. And in the case of hepatitis C virus, here's the five prime non-coding region of the viral RNA. It's also got an iris there like polio. It's highly structured. Two, there are two binding sites at the very five prime end for MIR-122. They're shown in blue here. And below it are the MIRs uh, shown binding to the viral RNA. So the viral RNA is in black and the mirrors are in light gray. There's one mirror and a second. So two mirror binding sites. And when the mirrors bind here, the virus replicates very well. Okay? In other tissues, there's no mirror one to two, and the virus doesn't replicate. A drug has been designed that blocks this interaction. It's called miravircin, and it basically is what's called an antagomir. It's this uh, drug shown in black and red. It is a DNA, it's an oligonucleotide of DNA with chemical modifications, so it's very stable in the circulation and doesn't turn over. And when this was injected into chimps, it protected them from hepatitis C virus infection because it prevents the mirror from binding to the RNA. It blocks up all the mirror that's produced. So this drug binds the mirror, not the viral RNA, and it prevents replication. It's now gone through phase two clinical trials in people and will probably be licensed for treatment of hepatitis C. So you can control the virulence of the virus by interfering with uh, a mirror that's needed for its replication. The next question is, which statement about determinants of viral virulence is incorrect? So virulence genes can encode viral proteins, of course. They can encode cellular proteins. They are the same in all viruses. No, they're different from virus to virus. We wouldn't work on them if we knew they were all the same because we would have figured some of them out. They can be found in untranslated regions for sure. I told you about the polio vaccine story. They may encode immune modulators, yes. Did you have a question? Yeah. When you say virulence genes can encode cellular proteins, were you talking about like RNA proteins? <coughs> virulence genes can encode cellular proteins. There are cellular virulence genes, right, like TRIM5-alpha and many other uh, intrinsic proteins that inhibit viral replication. So they are cellular proteins encoded by our genome that block virus replication. If you mess with those, you, have, you change virulence. Okay, got it? Okay. Now, other virulence genes have to do with how viruses kill cells. We haven't really talked about this much in this course. It's a kind of nebulous and unfocused area of research. But here are just a summary of some of the things that viruses do to kill cells. Remember cytopathic effects, the way viruses cause changes in cells. Uh, this is done mainly, of course, by cytolytic viruses. There are specific genes involved in doing this, and these are virulence factors as well because tissue damage is part of that. Many viruses inhibit protein and RNA synthesis, and this messes up the cell. The membranes get leaky, enzymes end up where they're not supposed to be, the cytoplasm degrades, and that causes cell damage. Envelope viruses, remember, cause syncytium formation. They, have, they make neighboring infected cells fuse, so they're multinucleate. That's part of the pathology of infection. And finally, we know there are very specific programs of cell damage, apoptosis, a newly discovered one, necrosis, pyroptosis. These are all responses to virus infection. The result is the cell dies. So if you interfere with either viral genes that antagonize these or the cellular genes that are involved in these pathways, you can influence virulence, hence they are virulence determinants. Now other things that viruses do, which are part of the disease spectrum, is they immunosuppress. This is a bit rare as far as we can tell, but it has serious consequences. So immunosuppression is basically a global suppression of the immune response by a virus infection. And this can have multiple sources. The virus could replicate in the immune cell. So HIV replicates in CD4 lymphocytes, T helper lymphocytes. It trashes them. You can imagine that that would have an immunosuppressive effect. Viruses can 
mess with cytokine levels. We make all of these modulators of cytokines that we've talked about, cytokine receptors, cytokine mimics, that can uh, cause immunosuppression because cytokines and chemokines are needed for an appropriate immune response. And viroceptors and virokines uh, contribute to that. They suppress the immune response. So many virus infections cause local immunosuppression to allow their multiplication, but some have global effects. And one of them is measles, which used to be a very common uh, infection of children. When I was a kid, there was no measles vaccine, and we all got measles. Now there's a measles vaccine, and it's preventable, but there's an outbreak in Manhattan. I don't know if you've heard about that. There tends to be outbreaks in the U.S. among people who don't immunize their kids, because there's still this misconception that the vaccine causes autism, which it does not. But people have come to not trust vaccines in general. A small fraction, and that's all that you need to get outbreaks. This is an experiment showing how measles infection suppresses the immune response. And this was done in a cohort of children who got naturally acquired measles. They were given a tuberculin tine test. I don't know if you know what that is, but if you have tuberculosis, you are immunoresponsive to the antigen. And it's easy to find out if someone has had tuberculosis or not by injecting a little bit of tuberculin, one of the antigens from the bacteria, subcutaneously. And within a day or so, you get an infiltration of immune cells and a, um, a swelling. It's, uh, it's very noticeable. And what we've done here, what has been done here, is to give these kids who have measles a tuberculin test to see how they respond. So here is the base response. This is the, the height of the, uh, of the uh, induration. It's caused, caused by the tuberculin test, seven millimeters in normal kids. And when the kid has a rash, look, th there's hardly any induration. There's, the TB test is negative. And then with weeks after the rash, you can give repeated tests. Uh, you see the, the immune response returns. So the tuberculin test depends on having an intact delayed type hypersensitivity response. It's an immune response. So you can see how measles infection is suppressing it. And this was one of the first clues that uh, measles was doing this. And how it works is that uh, the virus replicates in immune cells, in particular dendritic cells and monocytes. You know, these are the antigen presenting cells that present viral proteins in the lymph nodes to T and B cells. So infecting them is bad. Uh, they, also inf they also kill uh, circulating T lymphocytes directly, so their numbers go down. And you get messed up cytokine responses as well because the virus is interfering with that. So the consequence is you are globally immunosuppressed, and you can have other infections occur because your immune system is not able to deal with them. You can have opportunistic infections. So here are three viruses that cause uh, immunosuppression, measles, as we've talked about. So the manifestation. Uh, reduced delayed type hypersensitivity. That's the reaction you get when you get a tuberculin time test. And you get enhanced infections with other agents because your immune system isn't able to defend you. Rubella also immunosuppresses by replicating in lymphoid cells. And this leads to an inability to clear rubella infection. And we'll talk about HIV, which is, of course, the most severe immunosuppressor. It replicates in CD4 positive T cells, but also has many, many other global negative effects on the immune response. And that is actually the cause of death in the end, these opportunistic infections and cancers that occur as a consequence of being immunosuppressed. All right, the next question is, what is immunosuppression? All right, so uh, number one is correct, but a number of you have picked all of the above. So let's sort this out. Immunosuppression is a global reduction of the immune response caused by virus infection. Now, the reduction of antibody levels that occur after a virus infection is over is the natural decline in antibody uh, that takes place once the, the antigen is gone. So that's not immunosuppression. Killing of infected cells by CTL is not suppression, but that's an active immune response against infected cells. Uh, the measles virus rash is actually a consequence of the immune response, so it's not immunosuppression. So that's why it's uh, just number one. Now, there are, I want to talk now about genes in us that, co that control virulence by c controlling our susceptibility to infection. And this is an example of a gene in mice that controls susceptibility to a virus infection. 
So here is virus replication in the brain versus days after infection. These are two uh, strains of mice, uh, C3HHE and C3HRV. Not important what they are, that they are genetically different. Uh, and this one strain is uh, the virus replicates very well, quickly, and the mice are 100% dead uh, after four or five days. The other virus, uh, the other strain of mice, the virus kills about half of the animals. So this is the resistant strain. And in the animals that are dead, there's a little bit more virus than in the survivors. So if you do mouse crosses, you can do genetics and, and sort out where this maps, if it's a single gene. And that was done. It takes a long time. And it mapped to a gene called FLV, flavivirus susceptibility. It encodes 2 prime, 5 prime oligo A synthetase, which is an interferon stimulated gene needed to clear uh, RNA virus infections. One of the outcomes of uh, this gene is to degrade viral RNAs. So a mutation in this gene makes the mice more susceptible to infection. And we don't know if this is the case in humans. None of, we've never associated uh, any changes in FLV with susceptibility. We do have an FLV gene. We have the 2 prime, 5 prime oligo A synthetase. And it might have a role in, in susceptibility, but we haven't determined it yet. This is purely a mouse uh, experiment. But if you found that certain people were more susceptible to a particular RNA virus infection, what you could do nowadays would be to sequence their genome and ask, is there a mutation in any of these uh, interferon-related genes that associates with that? Here's a in, in very interesting example of um, a mutation in a receptor gene that affects susceptibility. Now, you may remember, it's a long time ago, but HIV uh, attaches to cells by binding to two receptors, CD4, and a chemokine receptor, CCR. Can be two different kinds, CCR5 or CXCR4, two different chemokine receptors. So here is HIV at the top, binding to CD4 and a chemokine receptor. In about 4 to 16 percent of people of European descent, there's a deletion in the CCR5 gene. It's a 32 base deletion, that's why it's called delta 32. And these people do not make the protein on the cell surface. So CCR is not made. Apparently, human life is compatible without having CCR5, because these individuals are fine. They don't seem to have any other health issues. They are resistant. If they are homozygous for the deletion, that is, both copies of the gene are deleted, they are resistant to HIV infection. And the heterozygotes are partially resistant to infection. Now, this was taken advantage of a couple of years ago. A German patient with AIDS was given a bone marrow transplant. And in this procedure, you irradiate the recipient to destroy all of the bone marrow. And then you give a transplant from a donor. You take some bone marrow out of the hip, and you put it into the recipient. And the donor, in this case, was someone with a Delta 32 mutation. This German patient, who was viremic before the procedure, is now virus free because all of his uh, lymphocytes where HIV DNA was integrated are gone. They were destroyed by irradiation and they're replaced with uh, the, CCR, the Delta 32 uh, bone marrow cells so he's resistant to infection. Now this is not a cure for AIDS because bone marrow transplants cost hundreds of thousands of dollars and there's a 30 percent mortality rate associated with them. However, very recently an experiment was done which I just wrote about uh, last week, they took from 12 patients, they took their lymphocytes out of their blood, they put them in culture, and they used zinc finger nucleases to disrupt the CCR5 gene. Now, so zinc finger nucleases are artificially made uh, enzymes that can be used to target a specific gene, cut out a piece, and now these lymphocytes no longer make CCR5. They're not homozygous mutations, all right, so they're, they're only one copy of the gene per cell. They put these back in the patients and their viral loads went down. So it's a proof of principle that you can do this. So at some point in the future, we'll be able to take out uh, lymphocytes, effectively target all the CCR5 genes and put them back into people. This is really an amazing study because they had to take 10 liters of blood from each patient to purify enough CD4 lymphocytes to do the procedure, culture them, infect them with an adenovirus to deliver the zinc finger nuclease, and then put them back in the patients. You should check it out. It's really 
amazing. Herpes simplex encephalitis. Herpes, you all have herpes simplex virus. You acquire it shortly after birth. Uh, you get it from your mother or father. You may get an initial infection with symptoms, but then uh, the virus infects the mucosal surface. It goes latent in your sensory and autonomic ganglia. And, and it persists for your lifetime. Periodically, the genome is expressed and you make virus, and that's how you pass the infection to someone else. Sometimes the virus goes the wrong way and goes into the central nervous system. And there you can get uh, herpes simplex encephalitis. In the US, the rate is one per 250,000 population. And it has a 70% mortality rate if untreated. We have antivirals that we can use to treat this, but often the children or the adults who get this have neurological deficits afterwards. And there are two peaks of incidence of this disease between six months and three years of age. This represents the primary infection from your parent where the virus sometimes goes to the wrong place, it goes to the brain. Or when you're older, greater than 50 years of old, reactivation from latency. The virus is reactivated from its latent genome and instead of going to make a fever sore, it goes into the CNS. So there seem to be people who are predisposed to getting herpes encephalitis. So a number of years ago, a, a genome-wide association was done on these individuals. So genome-wide association studies is where you take a population of individuals who have increased susceptibility to an infection, say, and you sequence their genome and see if any mutations go with that. You look for SNPs single nucleotide polymorphisms, which are basically mutations that differentiate one person from another that are associated with the trait. And in the case of herpes simplex encephalitis, they found mutations in TLR3, UNC93B, TRIF, or TRAF predispose people to getting herpes encephalitis. And they could re recover cells from these individuals, show that these defects are present, they allow extensive virus replication, and if you complement the defect by putting in the wild-type gene, you correct the defect and virus replication is dampened. What are these proteins? Well, you may remember TLR3 is one of the toll-like receptors. It's important for sensing herpes simplex virus infection. So if you have a single amino acid change, which may truncate the protein, you don't make TLR3. You can't sense infection. You probably make high virus loads, and that allows it to get into the CNS. Um, UNC, excuse me, UNC93B is a protein uh, in the ER that's important for getting TLR3 from the ER to the endosome. And uh, TRIF and TRAF are proteins that are involved in the signaling pathway from TLR3 to turning on cytokines in the nucleus. So genetic alterations in these innate immune response genes predispose these people to uh, herpes simplex encephalitis. In the same way, we have a gene associated with severe influenza. So IFITs are proteins that are induced by interferon. There's a whole bunch of them that can interfere at various stages of the replication cycle. IFIT M3 is an ISG that in, has, encodes a transmembrane protein. And if you knock out this gene in mice, they get much more severe influenza and much higher frequency of death. So in humans who get severe influenza, in any outbreak of influenza, there are always some who develop severe influenza, pneumonia, and need to be hospitalized. So the genomes of these individuals were sequenced. Again, genome-wide association studies looking for SNPs, and they found changes in the IFIT-M3 gene. So the idea is we all have polymorphisms in our genomes. We have random mutations. And if they happen to fall in immune response genes such as these, they will predispose you to, to serious disease. So these are just two examples of ongoing studies in many laboratories to figure out why people get a range of infectious symptoms. F influenza can cause an inapparent infection in some, and in others it can cause lethal disease. And mutations in these immune response genes are really important for determining that. Major histocompatibility proteins, MHC1 and 2, are also important determinants of disease outcome. Uh, these are two strains of mice that have a different uh, H2 allele, one of the histocompatibility genes. We have many genes encoding our MHC1 and 2 proteins, and they're highly polymorphic. There are thousands of alleles. 
and certain alleles are better at presenting peptides than others. And that's shown in this mouse study. These are two mice with different H2 alleles. And you can see uh, here we're looking at percent <coughs> swelling of the spleen. This mouse uh, fares much more poorly than does this mouse. Only tracked to a specific polymorphism in the MHC. This is why island populations of humans are much more susceptible to infectious disease because the polymorphism in their MHC proteins is restricted because there is a smaller pool of them uh, to uh, breed with. Elite controllers of AIDS are another example of the effect of uh, major histocompatibility proteins. Elite controllers are also known as long-term progressives. These are people with HIV infections that can live many, many years without antiretrovirals and without showing the symptoms of AIDS. There are many explanations for elite controllers, but one of them is an association with a specific MHC type 1 allele called HLA-B57. And this, if you remember, MHC1 is the pathway by which viral proteins produced in infected cells are are chopped up by the proteasome, they're loaded into the MHC1 molecule and shipped to the cell surface so they can be examined by CD8 cells to see if they're foreign and then of course the CD8 will kill them. During the course of an HIV infection, 10, 20 years, the virus spawns many variants of the peptides that are typically loaded into the MHC1 molecules. And this foils the MHC1 presentation because each MHC1 is only good at presenting uh, a certain peptide. But the B57 allele, for some reason, can accommodate all the variation that HIV throws at it. It can accommodate all the variant peptides that are, uh, that are spawned during infection, and hence they control infection uh, very well. So it's important to understand this, of course, because maybe we can somehow modify uh, the genome to include these kinds of alleles. Turns out that viral co-infections are a big cause of virulence. So this is an example of a co-infection of HIV and herpes simplex type 2. Now, herpes simplex type 2 is the genital herpes. It causes lesions. And people with uh, type 2 are always more susceptible to HIV. And the idea was that you have open lesions. Of course, the virus is going to get in. But it turns out that there's a specific mechanism. Uh, when herpes simplex type 2 uh, infects the genital mucosa, uh, it is sensed by Langerhan cells, a very specific kind of dendritic cell, which are shown here. Uh, these Langerhan cells, as part of the response, they make antimicrobial peptides. And one of these, it's a short peptide called LL37, is uh, upregulates, I'm sorry, the uh, antimicrobial peptides are produced by the mucosal epithelium, which is infected with herpes simplex type 2. The LL37 specifically uh, enters the dendritic cells. It upregulates CD4 and CCR5. And guess what? Those are the receptors for HIV1. So HIV1 infects uh, the Langerhans cells, makes it more likely that you're going to be infected because these are going to now go to the lymph node and present the virus to the cells that it wants to infect. And there are many other examples of microbial co-infections that we're becoming more aware of where the virulence is much more than uh, either infection uh, on its own. Which the following are examples of SNPs that control susceptibility to viral disease. Ooh. <laughs> wow. SNPs. What is a SNP? Single nucleotide polymorphism. OK. Viral co-infection is not a SNP. I don't know how many, I don't remember how many people picked that. Let's see. Podium PC. Yeah, only one, that's fine. 12 people picked the next one. CCR delta 32, 32 nucleotide deletion. It's not a SNP. A little tricky, okay. But it's, SNP is a single nucleotide polymorphism. Uh, mutations in TLR3 that pre predispose to herpes simplex, that's for sure. Those are single amino acid changes caused by a single nucleotide. Uh, change. The FLV gene is not. I didn't mention that that was a SNP. So technically, you could have answered four. And I see one, two, three. Not many people did. OK, fine. Most people did three. And then 15. What do we got? All of the above. No, can't be all of the above. All right. So I want you to understand that SNPs are single nucleotide uh, polymorphisms, not deletions, not co-infections. All right. Uh, just wrap it up now. Non-genetic determinants of susceptibility. Age. 
Very young and very old people are particularly susceptible to infections. The young, because their immune response isn't well developed, although sometimes that can help. If you, sometimes the young don't have immunopathology, the part of the infection that is the symptoms that are caused by the immune response. Uh, in older people, some of the ideas that we have are the lung is less elastic, our muscle, respiratory muscles not as good, cough reflex, a lot of activity to understand how this works. There are now mouse models of aging where you can see a definite increase in susceptibility as the mice age, and they're trying to figure out why uh, that is the case. Here's an example of this age distribution influenza in the U.S. from 1911 to 1915. You see the very young and the very old are particularly likely to, to die. This is the specific death rate. So everybody gets infected, but the young and the old die again, we think, because of immune response and other related issues. Now, there are some exceptions. In biology, as you know, there are always exceptions to what we say. Some infections are milder at a younger age, like polio, mumps, measles. And maybe, again, this is because there's less immunopathology because the immune response uh, isn't good. In 1918, there was a quite large uh, pandemic of influenza, which was lethal for the young and the old, as we know, but also for young adults, uh, 18 to 30 years old. And you can see here uh, on the top is the graph I just showed you of the age distribution. But in 1918 in particular, there was this bump of lethality in the middle, and we don't understand why this happened uh, to this day. It could have had something to do with immunity, but really the cause is unknown. Other determinants, gender, actually it's sex, not gender. Uh, gender is a cultural thing, sex is male or female. Males are slightly more susceptible to viral infections. Pregnancy makes you more susceptible to infection. These are probably hormonally related, but the mechanisms aren't known. Malnutrition is a big one. Measles is 300 times more lethal in countries where children aren't properly nourished. Uh, so this somehow influences susceptibility. Again, we don't know the exact mechanisms. Uh, cigarette smoking is, is very well known to increase susceptibility to respiratory infections, uh, air pollution, and stress. If you get stress, you're going to get uh, more infections. And again, we don't know why, but it probably has some hormonal interaction with the immune response. Did you know that stress is spelled backwards with desserts? So if you get stressed and you don't want to get infected, have dessert, I guess. <laughs> the last one I found is really an interesting story. You know, the old wives tale is that chicken soup will prevent a code, a cold. I don't know if you know that, but I actually found this paper in Chest, which is a respected journal. Chicken soup <laughs> inhibits neutrophil chemotaxis in vitro. So this is a essay where they take neutrophils out of people and put them in a culture and then they can measure their migration towards a chemokine. And they actually mixed chicken soup with these and shows that uh, it inhibits uh, neutrophil migration. This is dilution of soup. <laughs> and they actually give a recipe for the soup <laughs> in the materials and methods section of this paper. So this obviously is just a random thing and I can't understand how drinking soup would have any effect on your <laughs> respiratory neutrophil, but this is a, this is the one paper that comes up when people cite this. Okay, the last question is, which are the following are determinants of susceptibility to virus infection? Okay, it's all of the above. Thank you. Very good. <laughs>